Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be looking at primitive reflexes that are present in newborns. Specifically, we'll be looking at three things as they pertain to each reflex. One is a description of the reflex. In other words, what do we do to stimulate the reflex and what's the effect of it? Number two is integration. When in that first year of life does that reflex integrate? And then also the general purpose of the reflex. Now before we dive in here, one word on integration. A lot of the motor tasks and movements that infants are able to do at some point in the first year of life, they are not born being able to do. Take for example breastfeeding. When a baby is born, it does not volitionally breastfeed. It relies on reflexes to breastfeed. So in some ways, infants are born incomplete. Initially, for certain tasks, they rely on these reflexes. And over time, the reflex will do what we call integrate. And at the time of reflex integration, the task switches from being purely reflexive to then being volitional. And in order for an infant to mature, it is absolutely necessary for these reflexes to integrate and for those movements to become volitional. The first reflex here is the gallant reflex. This reflex is stimulated by touching the skin lightly along the spine from the shoulder down to the hip. So you see this dotted line right here, lightly brushing your finger from the shoulder all the way down to the hip. Now you'll notice that the finger is actually brushing down the left side of the spine. And so the infant responds by laterally flexing their trunk to the left, so left lateral flexion. So whatever side of the spine is being brushed, the lateral flexion occurs in the same direction. If you flip this baby the other way and brushed your finger down the right side of the spine, the baby would respond reflexively by laterally flexing to the right. So ipsilateral trunk, lateral flexion. The gallant reflex is first seen about 30 weeks before birth and is integrated around two months after birth. Quick note here on the integration times, all of these are times after birth. The purpose of the gallant reflex is to encourage movement and develop range of motion in the hips in preparation for walking and crawling. You'll also notice here that with this left lateral trunk flexion, there's also some left hip flexion. So there's hip flexion also on the same side. The second reflex shown here is the positive support reflex. This is elicited by holding the baby upright, as you see right here, with their weight placed on the balls of their feet. The net effect is stiffening of the legs and the trunk into extension through contraction of the appropriate muscles. For example, the quadriceps. In the back, you have the gluteus maximus, and technically also gluteus medius and minimus, and lumbar paraspinals, etc. The positive support reflex is first seen around 35 weeks before birth and then is integrated around two months. And its purpose is to encourage contraction of certain lower extremity muscles in a manner that will assist with standing and eventually walking. So helping to develop tone in those muscles and also coordination of the muscles that are needed to facilitate standing later on. The third one shown right here is the walking or stepping reflex. This is elicited by supporting the baby in an upright position with the soles of their feet on a firm surface. The net effect is going to be reciprocal flexion and extension of the legs, basically the same kind of stepping pattern generator that adults use to walk. You first see this reflex around 38 weeks before birth, and it normally integrates by about two months. The purpose of this is to promote the use of lower extremity muscles and stepping pattern generators that will be eventually used in independent walking. This also helps to develop tone in these muscles and also coordination and sequencing needed for that reciprocal pattern that you see in walking. Next we have the rooting reflex. This is elicited by touching the baby on one of their cheeks and they'll respond by performing ipsilateral cervical rotation with their mouth open. You see here the baby's left cheek is being touched so they would respond by opening their mouth and rotating their neck to the left. The mouth has to be open because this is the precursor to breastfeeding. To feed, they have to have their mouth open, and also they're going to turn their head in the direction of their mother's breast so that they can actually suckle. 
not shown here is also the suckling reflex, and the suckling reflex has to occur in conjunction with the rooting reflex. The suckling reflex is actually what helps to draw the milk into the baby's mouth from the mother's breast. You'll notice here that the rooting reflex begins around 28 weeks before birth and is normally integrated around three months. Not shown here is the suckling reflex. It usually is seen anywhere between 32 and 36 weeks before birth, although it's not normally mature until 36 weeks, and then it will integrate by about three to six months. Next, we have the palmar grasp reflex. This is elicited by putting pressure into the palm of the baby's hand, in particular on the ulnar side, so closest to the pinky as you see right there. And then the response is the baby forms a grip around whatever the object is, normally a parent's finger or thumb, so digital flexion. This reflex is normally seen beginning around the time of birth and will integrate around four months. The purpose of this is to create a basic motor pattern that lays the foundation for obtaining this voluntary ability after its integration. So basically just gripping things. Obviously as humans, we grip things with our hands and this is something that persists from birth all the way until death. Next we have the startle reflex, which is fairly similar to the Moro reflex, but we'll differentiate these in a minute. The startle reflex is normally elicited by a loud sudden noise. And the effect of this is the arms are gonna abduct with the fingers closed and then they're going to cross the trunk in a deduction with the elbows flexed. Notice here the baby still has its elbows flexed or bent, and normally it's going to be followed by crying. This reflex emerges around 28 weeks before birth and doesn't integrate until five months after birth. The purpose of the startle reflex is really as a survival instinct to help the infant alert the mother when there's potential danger. If there's a really loud noise, even as adults, we look towards it because it could be potential danger. And so obviously infants are completely dependent on their parents, so alerting the parent that there is a potential danger would be extremely important for something so vulnerable as a baby. The moral reflex is fairly similar, but it has a very different stimulus. You elicit the moral reflex by suddenly dropping the head into extension for a few inches. The infant's going to respond by abducting their arms, but this time the fingers are going to be open, and then they're going to cross the trunk into a deduction, also followed by crying. So very similar to the startle reflex. One of the major differences between the moral reflex and the startle reflex is the hands. In the moral reflex, notice the hands are open, so the fingers are abducted and extended, whereas in the startle reflex, they're more flexed and a deducted. Okay? Also notice in the moral reflex, the elbows are more extended, and in the startle reflex, the elbows are more flexed. And the purpose of the moral reflex is also a primitive survival instinct, probably to help the infant cling to its mother when there's a potential danger. That's why its arms open up and are followed by a deduction, closing in to potentially hold onto the mother. The moral reflex also emerges around 28 weeks before birth and then doesn't integrate until about five months after birth. Next, we have the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, which is sometimes called the fencing reflex, or I even think of it as a boxing stance reflex. So if you look, the neck is rotated to one side, and then the arm on that same side is extended and the arm opposite the direction of neck rotation is flexed, okay? So the stimulus for this is cervical rotation, doesn't matter which direction. The baby then responds reflexively with ipsilateral upper extremity extension and contralateral upper extremity flexion. This is most apparent at the elbow joint. So look at this baby. They have their neck rotated to their left. So the left arm extends, so that's ipsilateral, extension, and the contralateral one, the right arm, flexes, so contralateral upper extremity flexion. The asymmetrical tonic neck reflex has functions in both utero and after birth. In utero, it assists with the initial development of muscle tone and vestibular stimulation, so it stimulates the balance mechanism, which helps to form those neural connections even before birth, and then kicking movements, and we normally don't think about this with the legs, but obviously the baby can move their arms and push on the walls of the womb. 
reflexively, of course, but that also helps develop some muscle tone in the arms. And then after birth, uh, the baby is actually going to do this and get some twisting. You know, by twisting the neck and therefore getting some movement at the arms, you also get a little bit of rotation at the spine. And that twisting that this reflex allows for is an important precursor for other skills that are developed later in the first year of life, like crawling and walking and then skipping comes much later. But this reflex and developing the tone and the vestibular function are necessary for adequate development of these skills much later. Next, we have the tonic labyrinthine reflex. This has a different manifestation depending on whether the baby is in supine or prone. Here the baby is in supine, and reflexively they will extend their extremities and their spine. When the baby is positioned in prone, they'll reflexively flex their extremities and spine. So supine, everything extends. Prone, everything flexes. Now this reflex is going to emerge around the time of birth and doesn't integrate for about six months. And the purpose of this is to help with initially linking the vestibular sense to proprioceptive sense and helping to develop a sense of balance. It also helps with the development of muscle tone, posture, and coordination throughout the body. Notice that in this case the arms are coordinated together. The legs are also coordinated together and by moving all of them it helps to develop muscle tone in all of those extremities and the spine as well. Now before we had the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. This time we have the symmetrical tonic neck reflex. And this one has a different manifestation depending on whether the infant's neck is flexed or extended. So when the infant's neck is flexed, it facilitates upper extremity flexion and lower extremity extension. So one, notice that the upper and lower extremities are doing the opposite thing, but also notice that the upper extremity is always doing the same thing as the neck. So when the neck flexes, the upper extremities also flex, and then it's the lower extremities that always do something different. So you'll notice right here in this position, the baby's neck actually is going to tend to move into flexion because of gravity, and then you can see that the arms relatively flex like this, in particular the elbows. And then in this position relative to the next one, the legs are more extended. Okay? Now when the baby's neck moves into extension, like you see right here, the upper extremities do the same thing as the neck, so they're also going to extend. That's particularly noticeable at the elbow joint. And then the lower extremities are going to flex. You can see relative to the first position that the hips and the knees are more in a flexed position here. Now normally the symmetric tonic neck reflex doesn't emerge until around six months after birth and then it lasts about two to three months and so normally we'd say it integrates around eight months. This reflex helps with dissociation of the upper extremities and the lower extremities. It's sometimes called the crawling reflex because it allows the infant to make the transition from laying down to getting up on their hands and knees which facilitates crawling. Now on any exam, if you're asked, what does the baby learn first? Dissociation of the upper and lower extremities or dissociation of the upper extremities from each other? They actually learn dissociation of the upper extremities from each other first. Remember, go back to the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex which begins around birth but then integrates around six months. So if we look at this reflex right here, notice that the upper extremities have dissociated from each other. By dissociation we mean that one extremity is doing one thing and the other extremity is doing something different. So they have dissociated from one another. So actually babies learn upper extremity dissociation first. Then later on, between six and eight months, they learn dissociation of the upper extremities from the lower extremities. Because here, the upper extremities both times are doing the same thing. They're either both flexing or both extending. But then in each case, the lower extremities are doing the opposite. So it's not until six to eight months, two months later, that the baby learns to dissociate the upper from the lower extremities. So keep that in mind. Next, we have the plantar grasp reflex. This is a primitive reflex in humans, possibly vestigial, that likely serves no survival function. As humans, we are not equipped, anatomically speaking, to really grab things with our feet. We can grab things with our hands, of course. 
you'd have a better time grasping something with your elbow or your knee or your mouth even. The digits of the feet just anatomically are very bad at grasping things. One, they're very short. They're also kind of fat and thick relative to their length. So when you try and curl your toes, all that soft tissue kind of gets in the way and prevents you from really being able to grasp anything. And the only time someone would probably ever need to use grasping with the feet in real life is if they lost both of their hands and didn't have a prosthetic and needed to grasp something. Although in all reality, you'd probably be better off grasping something with your mouth. That being said, just like these other reflexes, it can still be used as an indicator of nervous system health in newborns. And as you can see here, it normally emerges around 28 weeks before birth and is the last of these to integrate, so not integrating until around nine months. The way it's elicited is by putting pressure on the base of the toes, and of course the effect is the analog of the palmar grasp, it's just toe flexion, and you can see that in the picture right here. The last reflex we're going to cover is the protective extension reflex, which is the only reflex shown yet that never actually integrates. We still have this reflex to this day. Okay? Let's say you're walking, minding your own business, and you trip on something, and you start to fall forward. What is the obvious response? You put your arms in front of you so that way you don't land on your face, right? It's an attempt to either break your fall or really just to protect yourself. The upper extremities are going to extend in the direction that you're losing your balance to protect against the fall in whatever way you need to. So there's three flavors of this, as I mentioned. So we have the forward kind. This is when there's a perturbation causing a loss of balance forward. So the arms extend forward to protect against the fall. Then we have the sideways variation. This is when there's a perturbation causing a loss of balance sideways or laterally. And so as you can see here, the arm is going to extend laterally in the direction of the fall for protection. And then finally, there's the backward variation. So a perturbation causing a loss of balance backward. The arms extend posteriorly to protect against the fall. If you look at the order that these actually emerge, the forward variation emerges first around five months, then the sideways one emerges around seven months after birth, and the backward one is going to emerge around nine months. But neither of these ever integrate. These are things that we keep with us the rest of our life because they're extremely useful in the sense that they occur very quickly and reflexively. If you're falling really fast, you don't want to have to think about sticking your arms out in front of you or behind you or to the side. That's something you might actually want to occur reflexively. And depending on what you've been taught in terms of ways to fall appropriately, like in jujitsu, they teach you a certain way to fall, um, these reflexes can be overridden. But in general, we carry these with us the rest of our lives. And if they are overridden, it is voluntary and only temporary. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of primitive reflexes in infants, what they look like, when they integrate, and what their overall purpose is. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.